Hey there, Nick Jutakis here. In this video, we're going to go over replacing PIP with UV in a Dockerized Flask and Django application. So I've got these two open source example Docker starter apps here for Django and Flask. We're going to be looking at a Git diff of the Flask version, but if you're using Django or something else, it's all the same here because UV is going to work for both. So in case you haven't heard, you know UV is a really fast Python dependency installation and management tool. It's an alternative to PIP and Poetry, so some other tools as well. And uh, yeah, I've been using it for the last couple of months. Not going to spend a whole lot of time here. If you're watching this video, you probably have an idea of what it is, but it is super, super fast. So in this project here, it used to take 30 seconds for me to do a pip install on some of the requirements of text file dependencies that we had here, but using UV, the same exact thing finishes in three seconds. So we're talking about a 10 times improvement there. And I've done some client work where I also switched over to using UV lightning fast. And then another really great benefit of UV as well is it actually has a proper lock file. And uh, yeah, so your dependencies, you can guarantee you're going to get the exact version that is in here and all the little sub dependency resolution here is here as well, which is pretty nice. Um, but yeah, with that said, you know, let's take a look here at the git diff of what changed so that you can switch pip over to using UV in the context of Docker. If you're not using Docker, that's fine. You know, some of the things here you can apply as well, but there are going to be some Docker specific things that are pretty interesting to talk about here. So let's take a look here at uh, the project. So yeah, I'll just do a quick search here for UV, you know, looking at some commits here that I've done in the past. Yeah, replacing pip with UV, that is the one. And don't worry, you know, this window's a little bit small. We're going to be looking at the full file in a second here, but this kind of gives us an overview of some of the files that you need to change to switch over. And I think it would make sense probably probably starting with pyproject.toml. That's a file you'll want to create if you don't already have it. And then also, yeah, we can just get rid of requirements at text entirely. So if we take a look here at the pyproject.toml, then, uh, you know, you might be already having this because you might use tools like rough and, you know, typically is configured using this. But yeah, you'll just want to make sure you have a project name, etc. And then uh, you have your list of dependencies here. That's really the focus of this video here. And, you know, you would go into your requirements at text file and just add your dependencies here instead of requirements at text. Um, and this would be your top level dependencies, for example. You don't need to do something like a pip freeze and add all of them here. You know, that's the purpose of the lock file, which UV is going to auto generate for us. But yeah, in this case, you know, these are all packages I care about. And I like to lock them down to a specific version. Even in this file, you know, technically the lock file is going to ensure that we get the specific versions that we had. Um, but yeah, I still like to lock them down to a specific version here, just because it's easier for me to pop into this file and be like, oh yeah, I'm using exactly Flask 3.1.0 here. And then I would go and, you know, update this version later if I wanted to do something else. We can even do that with UV directly with the command line, and uh, we'll see how that works as well. So with that said, yep, that would be step one. And then once you're happy with that, then you can just delete your requirements at text file. Now, pip doesn't really have this idea of a lock file, but I did write some little scripts to help create one. It doesn't quite work as nicely as UV's lock file, but it kind of, you know, did the 80%. Like it was much better than nothing, but still it wasn't great. But yeah, that would go away too if you happen to have that as well. You know, if you looked at some of my previous videos or this example starter wrap here. Um, but okay, so that's step one. Step two is going to be related to the Docker file itself. So let's take a look at some of the changes here. And by the way, this commit, you know, I did this a couple of months ago, 0 0.6.9 is not the latest release. So if we go over to uh, the releases here for UV, in the middle of June 2025, the latest release is 0 0.7.13, but you can just go to the releases here for UV and check out whatever the latest release is. Feel free to use uh, a more recent version. You know, I like this idea of version locking things down to a specific version uh, because, yeah, you know, this is one of the benefits of Docker, right? Having reproducible builds. If you didn't put that version number in there and you use something like latest, then, uh, yeah, that would get the latest version every time you build your image, but maybe something changes with UV and that's going to break things. So, yeah, I think it's worth it to version lock that, and then you can periodically update this to whatever you want. This project actually is already updated to use 0 0.7.13, which we'll see in a bit here. Uh, another change here, you know, related to that pyproject file that we just took a look at, you know, we can get rid of the requirements at text and instead we're going to copy in pyproject.toml as well as that UV lock file. Now, this asterisk here at the end is a very, very important because, you know, maybe the very first time that you're building this project, you don't even have a lock file generated. And if you didn't put that there and you just left it as uv.lock, then the Docker copy command is going to fail because that file is going to be missing. So this asterisk here makes the file optional. You know, there isn't other additional UV lock files that we need to copy in. For example, you know, uv.lock dot whatever, you know, that's not the use case that we're handling here. This is literally just being it. So it's optional. So it works with or without that file. And then, yeah, it just copies them into the work or whatever. But yep, yeah, that's uh, one change here. And, you know, another change here is, um, you know, I had this little wrapper script to run pip install. 
did the same thing for UV. Really, I just moved it underneath the environment variables. We're gonna go over this in a second here, but I think it's probably worth it to go over the environment variables first. So, by the way, this one in the middle here, completely ignore it. Just make pretend it doesn't exist on video because this ended up being a mistake. Uh, I very quickly pushed up another commit afterwards that got rid of this. We do not need it at all. So, let's start with uh, UV compile bytecode one. And yep, this one here is just going to, at build time, you know, when, when UV does all of its installing stuff, it is going to create the Python bytecode files for us, which is nice because that happens once at build time. So when our containers start, it doesn't have to generate those at runtime. So that's kind of nice. We pay the air quotes penalty of just doing that once at build time. It's a minor optimization, but it's pretty nice. And then also we have the UV project environment variable here. Now, this Docker setup runs the GUnicorn as a non-root user. It runs it as the Python user. I can't really cover all that in this video. I've done videos about that one in the past. I'll leave cards to all the references that I can find here or links in the description. Um, but in any case here, that's why this directory here is named Python. Uh, because this happens to be a Python base image, I just like to name my user, non-root user, to be matching that. But yeah, this dot local directory is where all the different Python packages are going to be installed by UV. Now, this is actually a really important environment variable because by default, UV is going to create a virtual environment and then have everything installed there. But since we're inside of a Dockerized world here, in my opinion, you don't really need a virtual environment. So setting this environment variable tells UV not to create a virtual environment. Instead, you know, everything just gets installed here and then you are good to go. Uh, I think that works quite nicely for uh, a Docker setup here. Okay, so these environment variables are set. Nice, it's really important that these are set before you actually run your UV commands to install stuff because we want these to be applied when you actually run your UV installer. So in this case here, let me go and take a look here at UV install. It's gonna be easier to look at it in a full, full screen over here. And you know, that's in that bin directory here, it gets copied into the image. And you know, I had something sort of similar with pip as well. You know, I kind of like extracting this thing out to its own dedicated shell script because think about this, and we'll go over this in a second here, but like, you know, when you're building your Docker image, you know, actually let's take a look maybe at the, the final Docker file or, you know, the latest version of the Docker file, you can see new version there. But yeah, you can see at this point in time, we do, let's say a Docker Compose build, right? I have it running already in this, in Tmux window. But yeah, in this case here, you know, let's say this is running. And yeah, this is going to happen at build time, right? When you would do a Docker Compose build. But let's say that you wanna, I don't know, maybe add a new dependency or update a dependency or maybe remove a dependency. And you still wanna be able to basically run your Docker Compose build to have everything get up to date. Well, that lock file is gonna be inside of your Docker image at build time. It's not going to be mounted out at build time to your Docker host, but at the same time, you wanna commit this UV lock file to version control, right? You push it up to GitHub or wherever, then uh, someone else can clone it down. They get the exact same versions when they do a Docker Compose build. That's what we want. So yeah, having this thing isolated out to its own script allows us to very easily just call it here. But this project also comes with a, a run script. I've done videos about this as well. But yeah, it has a convenience like, you know, depths install here to update all your dependencies. And what this really does is basically it just does a Docker Compose build. There's other things, whatever, not super important. But yeah, it does a, you know, a Docker Compose run web and then it just runs that same script. And the difference here though is when this runs, this is actually happening at runtime. Uh, and then that will have a value mount out and then your uv.lock file will end up um, being reflected back to your host. And now you have an updated lock file there that you can commit to version control. So let's go back to that script here and maybe take a peek at a little bit how this works. Cause really it's just running two uv commands here. But first we just wanna make sure that we actually always have an up-to-date lock file. You know, if we can't find one, if you know one doesn't exist, then it just runs a uv lock to actually allow UV to generate it for the first time. And, and then we actually run the sync command here. So UV sync, you can sort of think of it as like, I don't know, this install command, right? It is going to install all of our dependencies and it is using the dash dash frozen flag, which will fail if no lock file exists, by the way, but we're always gu guaranteed to have one. It's either gonna exist already or it's gonna get generated here. So we have one there. It also makes sure that when we run the sync command here, that uh, the lock file is not going to get updated at all. It's basically frozen or locked, kind of, you know, you can think about it like that. So it just guarantees that, hey, whatever is in the lock file is actually being installed. Nothing new, nothing less, nothing different. And then here we have uh, no install project. So if we go back to that pi project that, if I can type here in that pi project.tama file, you know, we do have this project heading here with a name, etc. And uh, by default, UV is going to install that as a project, but like, 
you know, in this case here, it's a web application. It in itself isn't really an installable Python project. You wouldn't like pip install like Flask Hello or whatever it is, right? You might have that, right? If you have a Python project like a command line tool or a library, then if you're using UV, then you wouldn't want to have this flag because, you know, maybe you want to have that set up so you can, you know, uh, play around with it locally. But yeah, in this case here, we're just using no install project. I think it kind of relates to almost being the opposite of like pip install editable dot r and then maybe you have you know requirements that text or whatever here this kind of sort of does the same thing in reverse i guess you know like since uv does that i think by default then this is kind of saying like don't do that whereas with this one with pip we have to tell it to actually do that by default to you know install the project but yeah in that case here that's how all this little script works here and now if we go back to our git diff here yeah there's really no other differences here in the docker file and that's really it. Honestly, though, you just make your pyproject.toml, put your dependencies in there, and then update your Docker file in order, by the way, like these things, again, have to happen in order. You want to make sure UV is installed, then uh, copy in your dependency files, and then, you know, set your environment variables, and then you can just run your dependency install script. So that is basically it. I have some a couple little notes here. Yeah, all right. So let's go over some of the commands here to, you know, in your day-to-day, -day, like how do you manage your dependencies? Maybe you want to add them, update them, delete them, do whatever you need to do. So in that case, you have a couple of different options here. You know, again, this is all in the context of this project. You'll need to modify some little things on your own if you're using something different, but it's generally the same things, right? So here it's like, well, if I wanted to update Flask to a newer version, which I don't think exists now, but if it did, version four came out, then I would just go into here and then run that uh, run, what, let me undo that one. And then I would go and run this uh, command here. You know, basically it's dot slash run space depths install. And again, it's in the readme file. Actually, I can probably split this window and you know, we can just show it here. You know, it would be like this if I were to run it. Sure, it would be like that. Um, or you can actually add no, dash dash no build. And then that will also avoid actually doing the build. Maybe you just want to update your lock file. You could do that. Uh, but yeah, that's one way to do it, right? Manually go into here and then update the version. Um, I guess before we maybe even continue, let's go over one other command that's pretty interesting that this run script provides here is UV outdated. So this will just go ahead and take a look at all the different dependencies that you have, and it'll identify which ones are able to be updated because a newer version exists. So you can see most of these are already at their latest version because I go into these projects and I update things every couple of weeks um, or whatever. But you can see here PyTest and Ruth, these are both updatable, PyTest Cov as well. So you know one workflow might be like, okay, let me run UV outdated every once in a while. And by the way, if you're not using this run script, the UV outdated command, it just basically runs where it does run UV tree and then out updated depth of one. And then also you could pass in whatever parameters, you know, that's really to this little shortcut here. But yeah, it's just doing like a Docker compose run web UV tree, blah, blah, blah. So if you're not using my project, then that's the UV command that you would run to get the output that we just saw over here. Okay. Because we only care about top level, level dependencies. That's why the depth is one. So I, I think let's see what it looks like without depth. It's been a while since I ran that one, but I think it'll show maybe sub dependencies as well. And that just became like super noisy. Yeah. It's like, you know, it is kind of cool, I guess, to see all that. But like, for me, it's like, I didn't really care about seeing that. But if you do, then maybe, yeah, you can just remove that dash dash one and then, uh, or depth one. And then, yeah, you can use whatever you like. But in that case here, okay, so like one workflow that you could do, let me just run it again with depth one so we have a clear view. But you could be like, okay, cool, I want to update PyTest. Fine, the latest version is 8.4.0. So then I will go here and then find this, uh, let me shrink this one, and then just change that to be 8.4.0. And then repeat that for all the dependencies that you have. You know, save the file. And then when you're ready, then you can do your depths install command, uh, like run depths colon install, and then or depths colon install, and then, yeah, that's going to build a new image. It's also going to output a new lock file, and then you'll be good to go. That is one way to do it. Another way to do it is, you know, through UV's commands as well. For example, you can do something like, I don't know, uh, run UV. And by the way, this is a shortcut from this run script as well. You can actually just run any UV command that you'd like, and you can take a look at its, its, you know, its outputs over here, different commands. They also have great documentation on their website, but it's really nice to explore some of this stuff if you're just looking around and, and want to see how things work. Yeah, a couple of different ways to do this one. So let's say you wanted to update that PyTest, right? You can do UV add, and then you can do PyTest, and then you can do equals uh, 840. And in this case here, I'm going to put in no sync. No sync is going to avoid building all these new dependencies, but it's still going to do all the dependency resolution and it's going to write out a new lock file. And since we're running this in the existing container that's running, then it's gonna be value mounted out and we can see the difference here. So let's do that and see how that works here. Cause again, if you go back to here, remember, actually let me undo that one just so we're back to 8.35. You know, that's the version that's written to this file right now, it's saved, etc. So we can just run this command here 
and boom, 200 milliseconds later, we have this now. It's already been updated to 8.40 for us. And if we go down here and run uh, a git diff, then we can see that uh, it actually also updated that lock file as well. So you can see the different hashes are changed here for this. You know, we don't need to worry about all this crazy stuff that was all updated by UV, but yeah, that lock file changed. And if we do a git status here, we can see that, uh, let me bring it up here. We can see that, yeah, that got changed all just from running this one command here. So let's bring this back to eight that, well, actually I'll just do a git restore, I guess might as well. Just bring this back to sanity here and that will be uv.lock. Yep, there we go. And then we go back to here, it's back to uh, 8.35. So that is one way to do it. You wanna add a new dependency, you can do this. You can also update an existing dependency, which we just demonstrated here. If it already exists, you put in a version that's newer than the one that you have, then you are good to go. So this add command, you know, it's almost like an upsert in a sense, right? It's gonna add a new one or update the other one. And you know, if you do something like this, and let's say, I don't know, there's this like test infra package that PyTest supports, right? Uh, it wouldn't really make sense in the context of a Flask application, but this is more of an Ansible thing. But in this case here, you know, I didn't even supply a version number, but we're adding a new dependency. And you can see that it added a brand new dependency here for this. It already got the latest version straight from PyPy. Just a heads up though, you know, it uses greater than equals. So you might want to change that to be equals equals uh, afterwards, you know, if you want to do that. You know, for example, that's up to you. But, you know, again, like I like to go to exact versions there, but something to be mindful of there. So that's basically that. Let me do a get status again, just so I can get restore the lock file back to its original state there. So that's uh, adding, right, or updating, and also with specific versions. You can also do removals as well. So you can do something like UV remove, and then you can type in whatever package that you want to remove. You know, maybe in this case, we want to get rid of. Uh, PyTest or whatever, we can do a no-sync. And then if we go back to here, you can see that it's been removed. Actually, maybe it's a little bit easier to see. If I go over here and then we do, I don't know, like a git diff, you can see that it's been removed. Also, the lock file, just like before, has been uh, updated as well to remove the things there. So that is pretty cool. Let's do another git status to git restore. And then we'll restore both of these files back to the how they are. But yeah, that's a pretty nice workflow, right? Depending on whatever is more convenient for you, you might want to just pop in here, add the version number. You know, you might want to do the add command. It's really up to you. Um, but yeah, if you're using Django or something like that or anything else, it's all going to work the same. But hopefully this gets you started there if you want to change over from pip to UV. So let us know in the comments below if you did it. If you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer all of them as well. If you liked the video, please give a thumbs up. It really does help a lot. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.